The show. Hello, wealthy monarchs, dictators, and emperors of the world. This is Gemma Represents the Show. My name is John, and I am joined by the man who is often imitated but never duplicated. OJ is here. You wouldn't want to duplicate me. It could only end poorly for all involved. Well, I definitely agree with that. <sighs> so, last week on the show, Seemed like you had a really good time. Is that true? Did you enjoy yourself? It was pretty fun. You always enjoy yourself on the show? Yeah. Other times where you don't enjoy yourself? There uh, maybe have been a moment where I was like, huh? When was this? I don't even remember. I'm just guessing that it happened at least once. And the truth comes out. What, dude? <laughs> I think... Uh, <laughs> so last week, of course, you did have a good time. <laughs> of course, you had a great time last week. We were joined by the very funny and pleasant... Ben Padden, he's a gentleman, mm-hmm. writer, creator, host of a million different things. Highlights of that interview for me was our discussion of bad video game ports. And then you guys spoke about Doctor Who for a long time. I had no idea what you're talking about. Sorry. I did get a Faulty Towers reference in there, which I was pretty happy about, though. Yeah, that, 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 that does take skill. And one of the questions I asked him was, what were the obstacles you had to overcome to find success? Mm-hmm. AKA, how, how did you stay ballsy all this, all this time, right? Yeah, f- and, funny, that. Uh, huh? Right, and he had a great answer about overcoming pessimism and negativity and how he moved to a, you know, another country to accomplish his goals, which is not an easy thing, right? Moved halfway across the world. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. No. So that was really great, and I think um, that will now become a staple question for our interviews. I think that's Go- a good idea. Right, ask, ask our guests how they have remained ballsy all this time and, and, and had the confidence and reached their goals. Mm. So I think, it's, I think it's, we're kind of falling into uh, shit questions now. <laughs> well, <Getting lazy. laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a good question. So No, it's a wonderful question and everyone's going to have a different answer. Everyone will have a different answer of different things they had to overcome and I'm trying to show people something, you know, that yeah. you, can, you can do anything you want to do. And sooner or later, viewers, we're going to find an answer that you know, it's going to make you think, you know, I, I was in that situation too. Or I, I'm in that situation right now. Perhaps, yes. So speaking of guests, we have an awesome guest today. We've outdone ourselves once again. <laughs> a man that's found great success in not one but two very difficult fields to be successful in. His voice acting talents can be heard in games like Super Street Fighter 4, World of Warcraft, among many others. And you can hear him in animated shows like Avatar... Code Geass, Batman Brave and the Bold. And you may know him as the lead singer for the hugely popular band, Godhead. Jason Charles Miller will be on the show today. OJ, what do you think about these turn of events, sir? It's an honor to have one such as such as him on this show. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty awesome. So looking mm. forward to that be later on in the show. Don't skip ahead. We'll know if you do. We will find out. Listen to the rest of it first. We're going to warm you up, you know. We're going to lube you up and get you ready. And then uh, we're going to be the main event. And then we'll give you the digital gonorrhea. Exactly. Then you become, a, yeah, well, that's a whole other story, but. <sighs> Here we go. Let's talk about some stuff. What do you say? Uh, that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> so, all of you at home, you may, have re- you may have noticed recently I haven't been releasing many new videos. You might be thinking to yourself, John is very lazy. He's probably sitting on the couch right now, watching soap operas, eating Doritos all day. That's probably what he's doing. That sounds like a wonderful life. It does, but it's not the truth. It's part of the truth, but not 100% of the truth. I have, in fact, been working on many things. When I do something, I go all out on it. I go all the way with it. Doesn't you know, go off half-cocked. I don't just get my toes, my feet wet. I jump right in the deep end. Swim to the bottom and pull some other people's bathing suits off as, on my way down. That's just how it's done. So, uh... <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. So some of you, you will see some of this stuff soon. I've been working on a lot of stuff. I want to thank everyone that's stuck with us and been patient 
you know, not unsubscribing or anything like that. I was waiting for the good content to come. It's coming, and hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy the new incoming content. And that includes a little something entitled Schnoz Man, Hole Punch, The Justice Lease, episode number three. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I was waiting for some kind of sound. So it took a little longer than we expected. I wanted to get two episodes out in March. I think I promised that. It's not going to happen but due to no scheduling conflicts and because we're learning how to do this as we go. And sometimes we have to rethink or redo stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it took a little longer than uh, we expected. But as long as there isn't some horrible catastrophe, we just have a little bit to finish up this weekend. And it's looking like this episode will be ready for launch on Monday, April the 2nd. You heard it here, folks. So that's what's it's looking like that's going to be the day. 99.9% sure. And I'm very curious to find out what the Rimborgia thinks about this episode. Put a lot of work into it. Mm-hmm. And uh, once it comes out, definitely let us know your thoughts on it. And we'll be discussing the episode in next week's episode of the show. Episode. Episode. Do you have anything else to add besides episode? episode no nah, no nah. yeah guys I, th- I think you're in for a treat we've been putting a lot of work into this so uh, you like what you've seen so far of the episode do i yeah you yeah saw dude something. i was cracking up when we were watching it so you enjoyed it then again i do find my own face we had another powerhouse me. acting performance from oj he <laughs> did himself a powerhouse performance hush 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 he will be nominated for several awards at the golden globes <laughs> Uh, Maybe the Blockbuster Video Awards. I don't think that's even a, a real thing or a, a company anymore. <laughs> if it were, I think they would spit on my face as I approached the door. And I brought up Blockbuster Video because I want to talk about the movie. See what I did there? Oh, yeah. That's called the Segway. You're getting around without having to walk on a two-wheeled contravance? I think that's what the... Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, I went to the movies the other day, and I wanted to see the movie... Casa de mi Padre, which is the new Will Ferrell movie, but sadly it's not playing in any of the theaters in my area. Ah, oh. It's a movie where he speaks Spanish. Do you, know about the, do you know anything about this movie? I've heard of it. I just don't know anything about it. He speaks Spanish the entire movie. What? Yeah, the entire movie's in Spanish. So I was like, this is, gonna be, this is kind of an interesting thing. I want to see it. It's not playing. I did find a place that has it. Uh, actually, the Palisades Mall, which is about 45 minutes away from me. So I'm going to go there probably uh, maybe next week or something and we'll go watch it. Well, I want to let you know, the Avon Theater near me might have it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, check check it first because uh, they okay. have a lot of independent films. I have to drive at least 40 minutes in, in any direction Either to see way. what Feral speak in Spanish. Totally worth it. <laughs> well, there so, I'm like, so I'm like, okay, I'm at, the, I'm at the movie theater. Let's go see something else. And, of course, the movie that everyone's talking about, The Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. I really didn't know anything about the movie, but I'm like, okay, Hunger Games, you know, it's a documentary. It's obviously a documentary about competitive eating at Kobayashi winning the Nathan's Hot Dog competition. And right? then the scandal. Oh, yeah, there's a whole crazy, yeah, what happened with that? I, was I don't remember. in it or something? I don't remember what the resolution was, but it didn't go well. He was arrested, wasn't he? I think so. So that would be a great movie. That's a, that's a great movie right there. That's what I thought it was. <laughs> it wasn't that, though. You know, it's not what it was all about. What I, what I did see, I did enjoy. I know you saw the movie, too, right? Yeah, I saw it with my father. All right, so what are your thoughts on the, the Hunger Games movie? Well, first of all, I hadn't read any of the books. Um, my dad had, actually. So my dad read everything first, just by accident. Like, he just accidentally read the book, somehow. Like just he, like fell, fell on top of him and you he, and he had to read it? What? He was on, looking on his Kindle for, oh, I need a new book to read. Hey, this is popular. And he just read it. It just showed up and he read it. So. Okay. so I saw the movie not really knowing anything about it except there were to be some stu- people who didn't eat very much who were trying to kill each other. And I was very thoroughly, very thoroughly entertained. I thought it was really a pretty, you know, really a, an entertaining movie. I mean, it was good. Um, my dad, having read the book, was able to make some more insightful comments, such as the main actor who played Katniss, the protagonist, um, was pretty much spot on, apparently, like perfect. Really? Yeah. Um, like he thought that she could act like soft and, you know, like a, like a frightened teenager and then go 
into like not rage mode, but get all get serious and intense at you know the right moments, you know when it really counted. Um, it was a very long movie. I think what two hours twenty two minutes. Yes. And what was interesting was plus with the previews, it's like four hours. Yeah. What was interesting was that the movie is really long, but you don't even get to the action until maybe halfway through the movie, if not later. Well, it starts off. It starts off very like things are moving. Yeah, like for the yeah, first act, and then it slows down a little bit, and then you, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll admit, I spent a good portion of the movie trying to figure out who everyone was. I like, I saw this one, this one female character. I'm like, I know this actor, and I'm thinking about. It, I'm like, Elizabeth Banks. What? It was awesome. What, what does that have to do with it? What, is, what does that matter? Nothing. I, and then I was trying to figure out who played. So, um, who you're played, a fan of Elizabeth Banks or something? Well, I, I like I like Scrubs and I like Thirty Rock, and she has been in both shows. Oh uh, yeah, okay, that's who yeah. that was. I'm like, this person yeah. looks so familiar. Who is this? But she's in such freaky makeup, and her hair is such random. You're the colors. kind of person that spends the whole movie trying to figure out who the people are and what they've been in, and not pay attention to the storyline. No, only about three minutes. <laughs> Until I figured it out, and then I spent maybe a minute trying to figure out who played the president, and then I didn't care anymore. People do that, like you're watching a movie, and then they'll sit there and, and they'll, who's that? I can't think of who that. Oh, I know. They'll talk, they'll talk no, to themselves. I don't let that interfere with the movie. I mean, I'll think about it for maybe a minute or two when it's quiet. Like, I didn't spend the entire movie thinking, was that Lenny Kravitz? Either. I knew it was. I didn't. I'm from the 90s. So, I felt the movie was a complete rip-off of Schwarzenegger's 1987 movie, The Running, Running Man. Man. Amazing <laughs> film, by the way. No, it really, it really wasn't. I mean, oh, come on, dude. His one-liners were especially good. No, no, no. I'm saying it really wasn't a rip-off of it. it was, oh, no. Would you say it was a good movie? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a great movie. Yeah. Not a well, rip-off. Games, I, really, I really enjoyed it a lot. Like, I, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I didn't even know if it was a book or anything. I pretty much realized at the end, because there really wasn't any big ending... Like yeah. oh okay this is probably a series. <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be I think two more two there's two more books so there'll be at least two. The more last books. one will be like two parts. <sighs> I'll squeeze four movies out of this thing. Yeah, yeah. well one, here's one thing I thought very was, was very interesting. Now I hadn't read the books and usually I don't pick up on details in movies like I I miss the small important stuff. <clears throat> like in the usual suspects, I had no idea what was going on, but I noticed in the movie that there's a couple of. I don't know if you'd say weird things that happen, but there's some very subtle things that happen with a few of the characters that I get the feeling if you read the book, it's much more pronounced. Like, well, that's like every, that's probably like everything though. Yeah, but, but what I thought was amazing or was really was very impressive by the filmmakers was that without taking an extra 15 minutes to show what's going on with this particular character, which I'm sure yeah. the book has whole chapters dedicated to him, right. it just subtly showed that he changed his behavior in a particular way to show that you know this is there's something very important going on and he's definitely feeling something very strong like it happens to two characters they didn't really explain that much but you understood it all like you said like the the entire structure of the government and and uh a lot of the stuff yeah they didn't, they didn't go they didn't go into great detail like this you know but you, they presented it in a way that you understood there's a lot of deep themes going on there you have uh you know class warfare and government control and propaganda and and love and stuff, and it was also a lot of fun to see kids murder each other. It was fun. Oh dear! So, it's all stuff that's been done before in books and movies, but it was really, it was put together in a really entertaining package. I thought. Yeah, and they really like nothing. Nothing that did was like revolutionary, but it was just, just really entertaining and well done. So. It was basically they put it together very well. Everything flowed very well. They, excuse me, I think handled children killing each other in... I guess as best as they could have possibly. It was kind of odd though, because how could the really young kids beat the like the like the eighteen year old kids? Um, how was that possible? Because was it between twelve and eighteen or something? 18, this, yeah. How could a twelve year old beat an eighteen year old? They didn't even that's like that's like starting puberty, and then that's like being done with it. It's like it's like it's like Bruce Banner fighting the Hulk. I, okay, sure. Well, think about is, it. Is Bruce it's, a, it's, a bigger buffer, it's a bigger, buffer, stronger version of. A younger kid, right? So I don't see how that's a fair fight. I don't think it's supposed to be. Categorize it by age groups. I want. Why not have an old an old person fight, too? (laughs) 
Well, they could be a diff- they could have divisions and weight classes. It'd be like UFC. Well, I think the the gist I got was that the Hunger Games themselves are supposed to be, um, not quite a like not a metaphor, but a lesson to the the sectors, the districts, to the districts that if you rise up, bad things are going to happen. Blah blah blah. So the children, children are the future, and they want to show that if you well, rise young up, people start are the fight, ones that fight the wars. Well, they're showing today. If, if you rise up and start a fight, your future is going to be snuffed out. You will just die. You I guess. I'm, and only one can be strong enough to survive, and that's the people in charge. Okay. Eh. I think uh, it's a great concept for a reality show. I'm surprised that our current networks hasn't, haven't done this yet. I would start watching reality TV. Imagine The Apprentice with this format. Ugh. Celebrity Apprentice, put them all in the woods, and then they got to fight. My money's on Lou Ferrigno. Lou Ferrigno, get Rachel Ray in there. Oh, she'll be able to cook up a squirrel or something. She won't go hungry. She'll probably she'll, you know, she'll just have to hide and, and cook herself some stuff and let everyone else, you know, war of attrition kind of thing. <sighs> get PB Herman in there, <sighs> a- Anderson Cooper. <laughs> That'd be a good show. You'd, you'd watch that, right? Yeah, although honestly, if they really want to do this, I think um, if they want to do it without killing people, they could get Nerf in on this. Do it with those uh, Nerf weapons they have. Well, then you're just having like a paintball reality show. That's no good. Yeah, kids are still hitting themselves over the head with sticks. So do you recommend the movie to people? Should people go and spend their money to see yes, the movie? Yes, I recommend the movie to people. You should go see it. You should go see it. I don't know if you necessarily need to see it in IMAX. But you should no, I wouldn't it. do that. I mean, there's no, it's not in 3D, which is good. Um, the big screen is nice. The extra sound is nice, but you can afford to see. I it. really love how they portrayed the, like the, you know, like the wealthy people, and they had these very, like, disgusting, gaudy-looking outfits on. They looked like the height of excess, you know. They looked like some of the aliens from Babylon Five. It was just like, you know, what can we attach to this outfit? Because we have so much to spend. <laughs> yeah. Add more ribbons. Add more, you know, whatever. How many colors can my hair be? Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was cool. I really like the host of the uh, the show. Oh, he did an amazing job. He was just, just real, you know, dickish, phony guy, you know. He's like the Smash TV guy. Yeah, bas- yeah basically. Good luck. You'll yeah. eat it. It was Smash TV, the movie. <laughs> Which was also Running Man. <laughs> right. Um, what so, we, yeah. I guess we'll see. I mean, it's, a, it's another movie that doesn't have an ending because it's part of a, a greater scheme yeah, to so just five movies. But and now, like, yeah. now you all, everyone saw it, so now you're kind of like, oh, I have to see the, the other ones. Or buy the books so, and find out in advance and taunt your so friends you didn't spend knowledge. 10 bucks, you spent 50 bucks. <laughs> your choice. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, man. Um, did you hear about the controversy about from sur- surrounding the movie a little bit? No. So one of the characters in the movie is named Rue. Yeah. And in the book, she's described as a very small, dark skinned girl. Very young. Yes. And in the movie, she was played by somebody who was very small and was dark skinned. Okay. And I don't know her background, but some people would say that she looks African American. And people were making the most horrifying racist comments on Facebook, on Twitter, saying, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have, you know, I'm really glad the movie did this because otherwise it would have felt really bad for her being in The Hunger Games. And like horrible things like that. Well, people are dumb. Yeah, it was, it, it, a lot of people start, like people put it up on Twitter, Facebook, and then, then there was a couple sites who just started posting all this horrible racist nonsense people, people put up there and they just started deleting their accounts left and right. <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what's going on out there in the world. It's it's really a shame that people are still doing that. I try not to pay attention. I, I come out of my hole and once a week and do the show and I go back in. <laughs> so. You check your shadow. There will be one more week of show. Yes. In any case, decent movie for, uh, yeah. for March. Right, we're gonna definitely going to have to do a movie spectacular. Bum, ba, da, bum. Everything, that we do is, everything that we do is a spectacular at the end of it, by the way. I don't know if you've realized this yet. We already have the Summer Spectacular, Summer Spectacular, when summer starts. And then we're going to do movies, Summer Movie Spectacular, mm-hmm. go through all the different Avengers, all that stuff. We did the Gaming Spectacular already, didn't we? 
We should. We got to do another one because we're not. Yeah. We have to be caught up with the next couple months. Oy. We should have a panel of uh, people in to talk about the couple the releases or something. A think tank. Yeah, yeah. Someone from every country. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. All right. So uh, we did this segment last week. And we weren't really sure how it would go. How it would go over. Yeah, because it involved a lot of talking by me, which I wasn't sure would go over very well. Usually it doesn't. So we were, <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we, were pretty certain, we were pretty certain that the Ramboys would either really love the segment or they would hate it. Like, they would, they would just hate it completely or love it and accept it. It turns out, the evidence being the positive comments we got from it, people really enjoyed it. They really liked it. OJ. I'm, I'm, that makes me happy. And we work for the people. The Ramborgia Nation is a democracy. So we must do what the people tell us to do. We will now take this time to return to OJ's dreamland. Yep. Take it away. All right. So this one's not very long. This is uh, from February 2nd, 2009. Or I guess the night of February 1st, 2009. Um... <clears throat> but it was rather peculiar. So okay. I was staying over. Um, I was a mo- just moving into a new apartment, which was actually a house with a, a roommate. Is this the dream or is this, this something that's going on? This is backstory for the dream. This is reality. <laughs> yes. So The lines are blurred in OJ's dreamland. <laughs> you don't know what reality or the dream is. So... Um, I was about to move into a place with uh, my friend Matt, um, and he and his girlfriend were showing me, in the dream, he and his girlfriend are showing me around the new house, which had somehow grown to be huge. Like, this place was gigantic. In real life, it was a basement, a first floor, and three bedrooms on the second floor that, uh, that were pretty small. Except here, in OJ's dreamland, the place was gigantic. Now, for some reason, the bedrooms were attached to the kitchen. I don't know why you'd attach bedrooms to the kitchen unless this you... This is the dream now. This is the dream, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why you would attach bedrooms to the kitchen. Maybe you're that hungry. Maybe I thought, you know, maybe dream me would want to be able to walk from dream bed to dream fridge to get some dream milk. I don't know. All right, so slow down here. So in this dream, yes. you're in the place that you're sleeping in already. Uh, the place I was about, I, I, I don't remember if at this point I'd moved in yet, but they okay, were showing so you, me the place. So that's the dream that you're, they're showing you it? Yes. Who was showing it to you? Uh, my roommate, Matt and his girlfriend. They were showing you the place. Yes. That you would all be moving into. Yes. And the, the bedrooms were attached to the kitchen. Yes. And the house was humongous. All right. Keep going. <clears throat> so for some reason they had two very very lanky cats like i think they were gray with really long really long feet really skinny cats like kind of creepy looking but in addition to the freaky cats they had a small it looked like a mouse or a chinchilla like a you know a small rodent yes which was gray i think with of like of course they did yes black of under hair now I told them that i thought their chinchilla mouse thing chinchouse mouse chilla whatever it was was cute so they decided they were going to make it cuter for me. They gave it some drugs. What yeah. type of drugs? I do not know. They gave it a pill or something. Okay. And the chinchilla thing just spazzed out. It went nuts, but apparently it was really cute. Like, the thing's f- freaking out and going crazy, but it's pretty much an aww moment somehow. Yes. And then you murdered it. No. no. The cats, on the other hand, started chasing it around the house. Yes. But fortunately, the cats were declawed, so they didn't hurt anything. And while they're chasing it around, they woke up another animal inhabitant of the house, a pet cartoon fox. He's a cartoon fox. A cartoon fox. Wow, this is a long one, huh? This is that's right. like, it, like, picture Robin Hood from the Disney movie, just not anthropomorphic just a fox drawn as a cartoon yes and after that man i couldn't remember anything else i just wrote down keep in mind this is only what i can actually remember of the dream the rest must have been nuts 
So yeah. All right. So you go into. Did you end up moving into this apartment? Yes, you've been there. This was your old place. Yes. And with the same roommates, they all live there. Uh, yeah. So I give you a lot of credit for moving, still moving in after this terrible nightmare. <laughs> You still had the cojones to so I'm going to move in anyway. Because I, I would take that as a premonition not to go there. <laughs> That's what I would think. Um, my analysis of the dream. First of all, you were obviously molested as a child. You say that every time. Second of all, <laughs> second of all perhaps you had some fears about moving into the new place. And that was the, the dream telling you. Manif- the, the fear manifesting itself in the dream. As a cute chinchilla? That's wholly unrelated. <laughs> that has to do with your mother issues. What? Your mother representing the chinchilla. What? And your teacher, in third grade, who you wanted nothing more than to have their approval, but you didn't get their approval, did you? The other students did. They represent the cat. The cat chases the chichilla. I don't know why. I'm still working on that part. Okay, what's the cartoon fox? The cartoon fox represents your child, your childhood side. That is saying, I don't really want to move here. I didn't want to grow up. I wanted to stay at home. But now I have to do this. Because Oh, because they woke it up. It was sleeping and they... It was sleeping. up, and that would made you think of it because you kind of you went to college, you put your your childhood behind you. It was dormant, and this is waking up these emotions in you, and now here it is. Wow! But I think you I think you did the right thing, because you actually you know you, you didn't take the dream as a, as a bad thing, and you, you still moved in and everything. So, <laughs> well, I knew they were dog people, so I didn't have to worry about cats. I'm exhausted now after this. <laughs> wow, okay. I didn't know my subconscious was such a drain on people. I feel like we got to do more with this. I feel like the show isn't maybe the best platform. We have to maybe show act these out or something. Well, I'd be happy to go over my own we'll nonsense. Keep going with in it. I think head. I'd like to hear people, you know, people's ideas and things if they still enjoy the segment, but uh. well, maybe we'll go back to these old ones someday. The ones yes. that people like. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll put my thinking cap on and come up with uh, some ideas to, to do with these things. Now, does the thinking cap go on over your present hat? My current hat is a thinking cap. Oh, so it's already there. Gotcha. It's, it's already there. So that's I'm why you're think. so smart all the time. You never take I'm it off. Think. I'm always thinking. Like yeah. Abraham Lincoln. All right, sir. Answer for the dream segment. I think we should uh, move on to the comments, unless you have anything else you want to speak about here. I think that's the gist of it. All right, let's continue. All right, do you want to do the first comment? Yes, I do. It's from Brown Power Ranger 66. It says, Silly OJ, shit tricks are for Rambo. Great show as always. <laughs> you know what, Rambo? You can have them, all right? You, you can Brown have... Power Ranger is great. He, he always has uh, some really good stuff. I always, I always notice. Yeah, it's... It... Pretty but, uh, constant stream of comments of hilarity. It comes from last week when we talked about the shitty Matrix is now called the Shitrich. Citrix. <laughs> Shitrix. Shitrix. And I, I said, oh, that should be a cereal. And now it is. It's become a cereal. And uh, <laughs> that's a really creative quote. I really, really enjoy that. Um, and Shitrix is for Rambo. And Silly OJ cannot have any. Well, that's fine. Because what I'm picturing as this cereal is it looks like Cocoa Puffs or Chocolate Krispies. But it's definitely not... It's delicious. You can't have any. Enjoy your E. coli. You get to be like that rabbit that only wanted a cereal and they were like, no. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> rabbit and Lucky should really hang out. The Lucky Charms leprechaun. What is up with that market? What is that marketing idea? Well, that's the it- thing. They're back. They're both reversed. Like in one, the rabbit's trying to get the cereal from the kids and he never gets it. In the other one, the kids are always trying to get the cereal from the, from the leprechaun. What about they bringing never- Fruity Pebbles with Barney? They took the Flintstones and totally bastardized the show. <laughs> because all of a sudden, Barney and Fred aren't friends. Oh, Barney's they're friends. Barney's trying to steal the pebbles. It's a, it's a friendly rivalry. 
No, he's trying to rob his house. He's trying to steal his cereal. It's got a completely, uh, like, like what, what is that? It's obvious that at some point at the quarry, Barney took a blow to the head, causing him to become incredibly obsessed with this particular brand of cereal. He lost his job and he, he's starving. <sighs> they fired him. Now he's just trying to get food. Oh. It's basically, the, the marketing idea is basically the Pokemon idea where it's you gotta get, you gotta get it. That's what the, uh, <laughs> no, seriously, that's what it is. Like, you're telling kids you have, oh, you know, this, this rabbit wants it. You should get it before him. You gotta go get that cereal. Go get it. Well, here's the difference, man. It's pretty brilliant. Here's the difference. Think about it. Barney always gets the cereal, and then Fred's trying to get it, right? Uh, he takes it from him. Yeah, but Fred, Fred never gets it back. Uh, Barney all right. always keeps it. Well, you, all right. And then he, well, at the end of the commercial is Fred chasing him, whereas right, they're always here. chasing the leprechaun, and, they're always cha- and the rabbit's always chasing the kids. Man, they just got to hang out with Barney. Barney can steal cereal from anybody. He only wants that one type, though. That's the problem. You know, this brings me up to something sad. I think there's going to be a time when people will know Fruity Pebbles but won't know the Flintstones. And that time is soon. And that uh, makes me sad. Well, they'll, they'll know the Flintstones just add, oh, those are the guys from the cereal. <laughs> yes, I know, but... Uh, <sighs> hey, man. It's the circle of life. And, it, yeah, definitely. Pretty odd vibe to the show this week. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of weird. I so, what's going on. Yeah, let, let, let's 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 move along to uh, this comment here from another boring Elper. Yeah, Elper. Okay. Boring Elper. Oh, my bad. Come on, dude. Sorry. On YouTube, come on. I know it's a, like you said, weird vibe to the show today. My brain's off kilter. Keep going. Keep going. All right. John and OJ should release a new line of cologne. Smell ballsy, my friends. So we now have a cereal. We have cologne. We have, the what Remborgia is, is a genius marketing team. What is next for the What is next for the Remborgia here? I don't know. Our own jet. The Remborgia. The Remborgia. A toilet. Oh man. The, I don't know. I mean, you'd probably just call it the John. <laughs> the Remba Day. Oh yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, you just could call it the John. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Let's move on. All right. Uh. This one's from Chronic Smoothie. Hey, John, when are you going to have Hazard on the show? He has done a lot for the Ramborgia and the show. I think he deserves to be on. We want Hazard. Yeah, Hazard, if you don't know already, he's the gentleman that has made the official show logos, as well as the Schnoz t-shirt design. And I have spoken to him in the past about coming on. I told him that whenever he wants to come on, he can do it. He's got to let us know. And he's actually a skydiver which I'm sure will make for some interesting conversation, right? Yeah. And uh, he told me that he wants to do a few more jumps before he comes on, so we'll have more you know, stuff to talk about, basically. Wow. So Hazard will be coming on in the future, so. Right on. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we've got a comment here without the name of the person, actually. It's uh, on the front. On the front? This is actually from Twitter. Oh, okay. This is from yes. Gangsta Bizot. This was taken from Twitter. We take we take comments from all over now. Oh, I remember this comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can actually send your comments into uh, stayballsy@gmail.com if you want to remain anonymous. Anonymous. That's a good <laughs> option. Why are you laughing at me? Because I was remembering another name that sounds like anonymous in my head. Okay. And uh, you can leave them on the comments of the video, obviously. And Twitter is a good option as well. So. Yeah. So here is the comment. I was nervous about giving a speech at school today, so I wore my show shirt and kicked its butt. Or, yeah, sorry. This is kicked its ass. Yeah. Another successful example of the stay ballsy approach it is undefeated. It is unmatched. It cannot be beaten. And congrats to you on your excellent speech. I'm sure it was an excellent speech. Congratulations, so. man. We're seriously that this is what we want to hear. We want to hear people yeah, going. We've out had there a couple of these stuff. every week now. It's really, really cool. So, I, I would love if we got a couple. Like, if, if I mean, we, we we can't say everything that comes in, but if we get a couple more each week before, you know, if it scales upward and people are doing greater and great, you know, more and more people are, you know, changing their lives in a positive manner. Dude, I want to sit here years and years from now and have people tell me, you know. I, I used to listen to the show, or I, or I still listen to the show. I stayed ballsy. I made millions of dollars. Or 
and here's like I am a now the, hundred. I am now. now the president. I am now your president, of, and I, as a former listener, I think we, we can do it. We would like you to be the secretary of balls. See, or the guy that made the millions, maybe you say, I want to give you some of the money yeah. that I made. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> that, seriously, if you already have a million dollars, don't don't wait. Act today. That's the grand scheme here. We're inspiring people to be very successful so then they can then give us kickbacks. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're, we would be honored to take your money. Yes. All right. So I just want everybody to do well. So. Yeah, just get out there and do your best and rock it. The next comment goes hand in hand with this. What yeah, this is from our dear friend, Joe M. One two three four five six nine. I'm really happy to hear all these stories of staying ballsy, improving people's lives. Self confidence is so important when dealing with girls, job interviews, and a whole array of situations. Also, having the Ramborgia there to pick you up when you get knocked down is very cool for those out there that struggle with staying ballsy. Much love as always. That's nice. Yeah, confidence is really the uh, the ingredient for success. I think. Even if you're not confident, you can fake it, and then you'll like turn around at some point and realize, wait, I am confident now. How did this happen? People react and, to it. They will react. Even if you don't think you can, you're confident, just try it anyway. They will react as if you are, and then you will be. You want people to, to lie? No. If you're <laughs> nervous about something, act as if you're not nervous about it. Well, here's the thing. There's no reason not to be confident in the first place. Because anything that a human being has accomplished, you're a human being, you can accomplish the same things. You can't be afraid to fail. There's no reason to be afraid to fail. Because if you fail, you're just right back where you were. Exactly. And actually, you're not back where you were because you're better off no matter what because you learn. You learn from the failure. And that will improve you for next time, you know? Mm -hmm. So, we definitely want to keep hearing these stories. Ways that being confident is helping you. Makes us feel good to think that uh, we're putting some positive vibes out there in the world. And I think it's good to just hear stories of people doing well. There's so much negativity in the media and the news today. Just right. hearing somebody say, I was really scared. I got out there and I did it and it was awesome. That's, that's really a refreshing... I mean, if, if, if one person goes out there and is awesome, why can't you go out there and be awesome? It just, yeah, even if the, even if it doesn't work out, uh, it's, you still you still put yourself out there and, and try it. So yeah. You know. Also, I want if anyone needs help with things out there, if people need help with anything, you know, continue to ask us and, mm -hmm. and try our best. Yeah. yeah. Now speaking of stuff like that, I want to say something that Ram add something that Rambo told me, and uh, I don't, I, I think this might have come up on the show before, but I want to reiterate because this is really important. Um, set some goals. Maybe set a goal and really think what when you're doing something, am I, can I be doing, am I doing something that'll be putting me closer to my goal? You know, then every time that you do something like every day, you do something a little bit toward that goal. You're going to feel great about it because you're, you're seeing yourself get closer and closer to what you want to achieve. So just think of, think of what it is you really want to get, what, what does you really want to do with your life, with your week, with your day, with the next five minutes, whatever. And you know, figure out, okay, how can I get there? And then right. you don't have to do it all at once, just piece by piece. And you'll, every step you take, you'll feel better. It's awesome. Yeah, like I said, it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work out. But if you go to bed at the end of the night and you say, you know, this is my goal and I tried something that would get me toward it or I did some, something that would hopefully get me there, whether it worked or it didn't, you know, that was, that was a good day. Yes. Yeah. You know, so. Well, let's continue here. All right. So, so this comment is from Mama Dawa. My husband and I met on the MMORPG World of Warcraft about six years ago. He is from Quebec, Canada, and I am from California. We became interested in each other, talked a lot on instant messengers, and eventually Skype, fell in love, and became best friends. We got married in Vegas on December 28, 2011, and now continue our long-distance relationship while waiting for visa paperwork to be processed. It may not always be easy, but to anyone thinking about entering an LDR, if it feels right, go for it. Smiley face above the ground. There you go, man. So we get a lot of questions about long-distance relationships. And here's an example of all working out and coming together. You know, so yeah. there you go. It's, it's, it's doable. It's, it's, nothing is beyond doable. 
Go well, for your dreams. You guys, you guys could have invited me to the wedding. I do enjoy Vegas. Uh, that is one of the negatives here. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no love, what, is it, what do they say? Love knows no... Uh, love no, knows no distances? No distant, love knows nothing bad. Love conquers all. Love, love conquers knows no bounds. Love, distances and, and all kinds of, uh, you know, anything there is. So. What is love? Never mind, I'm not going to say that. It's, it's a whole other show. <laughs> no, I had the song stuck in my head. Anyway, that, that's... I'll that's the show really... where we explain the birds and the beast to OJ. <laughs> Silence reigns. Super. Like a... <laughs> so, hey, uh, how about I this... Hear, I, I can hear your anger. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm angry now? I can hear it. Really? All right. So, this next comment comes from Harry Peter 117 Hey, John and OJ. I'm in high school, and I've been with the same girlfriend for about I three years I think his name is Harry Pete. You, you say Harry? Harry. H-A-R-R-Y. You said it like, it, you said it like hair. No. Harry Peter. Harry Peter. Harry, Harry Peter. Harry Peter. His name's Harry. Yeah, Harry. Not Harry. That's how I pronounce Harry. <laughs> what? Right, I'm just making, I'm making sure everyone knows what's going on here. Okay. Right. This comment comes from... H A R R Y P E T E R 117. Hey, John and OJ. I'm in high school and I've been with the same girlfriend for about three years now. She's very sweet to me, but at the same time, she's very self centered and untrustworthy. I can't stand the way she treats me and I can't stay with her anymore. I'm just afraid of hurting her and I'm also very afraid of being alone. Finding another girl who makes me smile like her seems impossible. I could just use some advice from the great John Rambo and OJ. Thanks and stay ballsy. Yeah, it's a very tough situation. You're in high school and you've been together for three years. Yeah. So you've been through quite a bit together. You know, it's quite a lot. You basically grew up together, right? Mm hmm. At that age, so. And when you're with someone that long, it becomes kind of like a defining aspect of who you are. You know, especially at that age, you probably share all the same friends and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. But what you have to do is remove all the extra stuff from the situation. So take your history and your past together, put it aside. Take your fears of what might happen if you're not together and all that. Put that aside as well. That's all extra stuff that's stopping you from fixing the real issue. Focus on the present and the, and the relationship today and, and right now, you know. Mm -hmm. And if things are going on that you don't like, if she's doing things that make you unhappy, all you can do is talk to her about it. Yeah. Lay it out, you know, calmly, lovingly. Don't start yelling. Mm-hmm. Not yet, anyway. Aw, dude. <laughs> you know, if she's the right person, she'll respect what you have to say, and she'll take it seriously, and then you'll see what happens. And you said a lot of things that make me think it's not totally over yet. For instance, you know, she's very sweet to you, mm -hmm. makes you smile like no one else. That's good stuff. But at the same time, I feel your pain because you said she's self-centered and untrustworthy. So you want to love her completely, but she has these two sides to her. The good and the bad. Yeah. And you know, everyone everyone kinda has, everyone's kinda like that. You know, the yin and yang. Everyone has their good side and their bad side. And you can try to change the negative side, but sometimes you gotta have to take the take the bad with the good or take nothing at all, you know? Yeah. So you gotta kinda think to yourself which side outweighs the other. Is the bad is her bad side overwhelming the good side? You mentioned that um, she's self-centered and untrustworthy. If she's done something to seriously betray your trust, that's a pretty big issue. And I hope that if you, that you have, and if you haven't yet, you will, you know, speak with her about what it is exactly that's bothering you or why you feel unable to trust her. Um, and uh, what John said is pretty accurate i mean if you're in a situation where you know you're not happy it's not going to be fair to to her either if it's a relationship between two people if one person's not happy right. i'm you you've got to you know go over it with her and try and figure out what's going on and if it's clear that you're not going to be able to be happy in this situation anymore you really can't afford to you know just keep stringing out the relationship but yeah if you guys really give it your all and you work hard on it and there's something here that is still beautiful, you know, just got to yeah, talk, uh, talk it through. Don't be afraid to hurt her. 
you know, if she's doing things that are hurting you and, and she won't stop doing them, and she's obviously not afraid to hurt you or cares if she does. Well, don't do anything spiteful, but don't. No, let's say that. Yeah. But you have, if you have, he's afraid to, to break it off. Yeah, if you have to break it off, I mean, I've known people who would do very unpleasant things to their significant others, and that's just not cool. And you can you sit there and you watch it happen, and you know if and they won't leave the relationship. They yeah. they don't want to hurt the other person, but if you're hurting yourself, it's really not good. I mean. Right. If you're hurting yourself, you're preventing them from finding somebody else and preventing. Well, you you're gonna do is else. you're you know you're gonna you're gonna stay with her. She's just gonna make you dislike her more, and you're gonna you're gonna harbor more and more resentment, and that's not good for you or her. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, so that's that's a lot clearer than what I was trying to so say. So all you can do, you gotta talk it out, let her know everything that's on your mind. You know, don't hold back, but do it in a you know calm manner. Yeah, and uh, see how she reacts and if things change. Yeah. Just and don't get caught up in the other stuff, you know, will I find someone else and the fear and, uh, you know, oh, we, we've been through this and that and, and how could I, you know, end this now and, you know, none of that, none of that's really relevant anymore. It's, yeah, don't, 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 don't take that into consideration. Don't worry about it. You can't worry too much about the past or what might happen in the future when you have problems in the present. Exactly. If you're, if you are presently unhappy really shouldn't be worrying about whether you're going to be unhappy in the future because you need to you know resolve your situation now if you want a chance to be happy in the future you know exactly sir so in short talk it out all right so that's going to do it for the first part of the show here we're going to move on to our guest for the week are you prepared you know it you got some questions lined up darn right i do oh yeah okay see what you got oh bring it all right, welcome back to the show. Our guest this week's voice acting talents can be heard in games like Super Street Fighter 4, World of Warcraft. He's featured in animation, including Avatar, Batman, Brave and the Bold, Cold Geass. And he is, of course, the lead singer of Godhead and a solo artist as well. Welcome to the show, Jason Charles Miller. Hey. How you doing? How's it going, Jason? Good. Very happy to have you on. You're, you're very unique in that you have been successful in not one but two fields that are very difficult to be successful in, music and acting, do you have a secret third talent that you plan on becoming very successful with soon in the future? Uh, Yes. Lawnmower repair. (laughs) (laughs) So you're saying you've really made the cut. I think they made a... Yeah, I think... Good one. I think they made a movie about that, though, so look out. Okay. Right on. Um, So let's start start off... let's, uh, Let's talk about music a little bit. Yeah. Um, you're, of course, the lead singer of uh, Godhead, very popular band. Take us back to the beginning of it all. What inspired you to say, I'm going to play music, kick ass, and people are going to pay me for it someday? Well, uh, I, you know, I don't think I really thought about the payment part till later. <laughs> okay. Uh, which luckily did happen, at least for a while. Um, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, I think, man, honestly, when I was five, when I was five, I started singing in front of live audiences and, um, I was kind of an awkward kid and I was a nerd. I still am. But when I was performing, like all of that fell away and all the awkwardness fell away and it was just something that I felt at home doing and made me feel great. So, uh, yeah, I pursued that for the rest of my life. Right on. So what was the first moment in the early days with Godhead where you realized, like, we got something here, we got something good here, and we can go big places with this, perhaps? Well, I I think when, really, we saw the audience reaction, because we would play a lot. We were one of those bands where um, we had a great manager. Our first manager was, was, was really great and really kind of pointed us in the right direction. And, um... One of his advice, one one of his pieces of advice to us was, take any gig you can get. Like if a band, like become friends with all the club owners, all the local club club owners. This is in Virginia, in like the near Washington D.C. Uh, also, Baltimore wasn't too far, so that was within our realm of of transportation. So um, you know, become 
friends with all the club owners, and if anyone cancels at any time, just be available to play. Be huh. available to play as an opener. Um, and and that was great advice because then we got to play a lot more than other bands, and we got to be seen in front of other people's crowds more, and that we could see what would work with certain crowds, what didn't work with certain crowds, and and just, you know, time in front of people was what, you know, you know, was sort of working ourselves out to a crowd really, I think, was, was a huge learning experience. So you guys were the first band to be signed to Marilyn Manson's record label. Yeah. How did that all come about? Well, um, we were doing a lot on our own. We were signed to some smaller independent labels um, in Europe, actually, and then in the States. So we were touring. This was like in the late 90s, and we were touring on our own and sort of just as an indie act, but, but making it work. And Marilyn Manson's manager saw us play when we opened for Christian Death at the Key Club in Hollywood and uh, approached us then and said that they were putting a label together. And then a few months later, they flew me out to Hollywood. This is when I, I think I lived in Maryland at the time. Um, okay. They flew me out to Hollywood and I met Marilyn Manson and this creepy mansion and this dark <laughs> with all of these like there was like a stuffed monkey in there and oh nice wow. it was it was full on it was uh you know so that was that was pretty awesome actually so i i worked pretty closely with him for a couple of years and that did you enjoy working with mr manson yeah i mean uh there was there was um you know, all you never knew what was going to happen, you know, and there was just like a really cool vibe to the whole thing. And, and, um, he certainly helped our career quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, I definitely enjoyed working with him. Good stuff. So you started making music in the nineties and many bands and people have come and gone since then, but you're still going strong. What do you attribute your staying power to all this time? Uh, I guess just, the ability to kind of adapt to from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things and always sort of being um, uh, paying attention, you know, not resting, not um, thinking, oh, well, I got this and there's a certain way to do it and that's what I'm going to do. And always being open to learning, I think, is what has kept, kept things going for me. So it's, uh, it's 2012 now. It seems like over the last decade, pop music and auto-tuned stuff has really dominated um, the music charts yeah. in place of rock music. Yeah. Uh, why, do you, why do you feel that that is? Well, you know, I mean, trends come and go. Things always change. I, what I think is interesting now about auto-tune is that now that so many people know how to use it, I see that um, actually having talent is coming back again. <laughs> wow! Well. Because you know you can you uh, you know people see through marketing tricks now. People you know because we're so globally connected, um, no one quote unquote believes the hype anymore. And so I think that and and everyone knows about autotune. And, and, and I think that actually having talent is starting to matter again. And, and, and I see that with a lot of newer acts and that makes me happy because, um, you know, anybody can be auto-tuned and, and made into a star. And I think now that the public sort of knows that and is aware of that, um, it sort of levels the playing field yet again. Huh, very interesting. I mean, I'm seeing this trend, I, and maybe you guys don't see it yet, but you will see it um, because it's it's uh, you know the 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 man behind the curtain is the curtain has been pulled back now. Do you know what I mean? Right. Huh? How does the uh, how is the music industry today different than when you first broke in? Um, then, well, it's completely different. Um, you've got 
you've got um, a case where, you know, if you're if you're innovative enough and good enough, you can get your music to everyone and people will listen to it. Um, like I was saying before, it's like no one believes the hype anymore. And I think we all have listener fatigue in the sense that, um, you know, if I'm sure if you see a pop-up ad for a new band, you're not going to click on it. You're just like, whatever. <laughs> nope. But it's true. if your friend says, hey, dude, listen to this. This is awesome. You're going to pay attention to it if you trust that friend's taste. You know, mm-hmm. And I think that that is what's coming around again that uh, if something is, is really, truly great, um, no amount of marketing is going to make a difference. It just really depends on if um, your friends like it and their friends like it and their friends like it. And, and um, there's really a revolution there. Now, in the same respect, you know, you also see um, anybody that takes guitar lessons for six months can now put an album out on iTunes. You know what I mean? So right. you also have that sort of the playing field is somewhat muddied in a way. But I think that that once again, that is going to change to the point to where um, people trust their friends and people trust trust tastemakers and 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 people have enough sense to say if something's crap or not, because nothing can really be nothing can be push down our throats anymore it, it's it's in 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 the 90s if atlantic records decided that they wanted to make someone a star they would do whatever it took to make sure that you heard that song a gazillion times and there mm-hmm. were only a few outlets for you to hear it radio and television now you know everything is has opened up to where they could spend the same amount of time and money trying to make that person a star, and maybe they would have a, a single that charted on the Billboard charts or that charted on the radio charts. But there's a good chance that you and I would never even hear that song. I mean, right. in, 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 when I started in the 90s, the number one song in the nation, everyone had heard it. Everyone knows what it is. But I couldn't tell you today what the number one song is. This yeah, I couldn't either. <laughs> and that's really a big difference between then and now. Whereas, um, you know, if there's a certain type of music that you like, chances are you're going to be able to find that uh, in your own uh, niche on the web and, and be really happy with the artists that are coming out with that. And in the same respect, I think that people's music musical tastes have widened quite a bit. To where, like, if you you've probably noticed, and maybe you're we haven't touched on it yet, that you know, Godhead is this industrial metal kind of vibe, and my solo material is like this country Americana, rootsy, swampy kind of stuff. Now they're 180 degrees from each other, but what I've found is that um, a lot of fans of Godhead have come over to check out my solo stuff and have become fans of that and i think that that really shows that people aren't afraid to diversify their taste as much as they used to they used to you know right. because because also and i'm i know i'm like a big old run on sentence right now but if we're going from oh keep going it's cool man we're going from before to now okay um if if i decided that I was going to be a if 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 someone decided like hey I'm going to be a metalhead, well you know what if 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 something about metal sparked your enjoyment you had to go head to the record store or, or, or had a friend, friend that had all had all and now now you want to run to metal metal just you go on to anyone to any that you want you want for every it's metal metal you know what I mean, you know what I mean? same with the same with country, the country history of jazz, jazz. jazz. and and if that's what that was Tastes are wonderful. It's easier, easier for them to have access to hear all these different kinds of music and make their own decision. Right. Do you feel like the music industry is trying to regain some of that control that they had in the '90s and try to regain the, you know, that 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 level of, uh, you know, this is what you're going to listen to now? Yeah, they're trying, but they're going to fail. Good. They're absolutely going to fail. Like, there's no way that there's you can't 
fight progress. You know what I mean? Like, right. but we're, you know, it, they want to all bury their heads in the, in the sand and make everyone go back to just buying CDs. You know, that's not going to happen. Right. So you've got to embrace the change and move forward with it. What are some bands that you like that maybe the mainstream public hasn't yet heard of? Um, it depends on the genre. Like in, um, got in, in sort of like goth electronica music, I like a band um, called The Birthday Massacre. Uh, and um, for... Uh, Man, it, it it's it's tough. I've been I've been kind of so immersed in the country world the last couple of years that, uh, that there's a, there's a there's a great artist by the name of Randall Clay, and I've had the uh, the good fortune of writing some songs with him. And this guy's the real deal. I think he's going to be like what Waylon Jennings did to country in the '70s and just sort of turn it turn it on its ear. You cool. know, there's there's so there's so many. Uh, I've been spending a ton of time in Nashville. And Nashville is really the last bastion of the old school um, at, because they're, they still have a, a strong grip on, um, you know, what they're going to tell people to listen to. And that's really the last um, empire, so to speak, that will eventually fall. And, and, um, but there's a whole under there, – there's a whole like sort of underground in Nashville – of artists that love country but love pure country music and not what we're hearing on the radio because a lot of stuff that we hear on the radio is really just pop music with fiddles and <laughs> almost anyone almost anyone in the industry will admit that openly like this is really just pop music with a banjo and a fiddle kind of mixed in yeah and so there's that void there that that people that identify with like american country music that love the uh you know, the Willie Nelsons and, and the Chris Christophersons and the Merle Haggards of the world, the Johnny Cash, you know, that people that identify with that as country, there's this huge gap. And, and um, guys like Randall Clay are really bringing that back. And, and, you know, I'm happy to be sort of a part of that, of that movement and, and trying to make that movement happen. Do you think that heavy rock music will ever come back in a big way as far as like being like the, a band once again will be like the top, you know, music act in the in the world again. Well, I hope so, and but you know, um, and, and I think that it will. But unfortunately, you know, um, that's another piece of you know the establishment. Now, whether you like them or whether you hate them, and I'm guessing that you probably hate them because most people do. Nickelback. Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Nickelback ha has done a very good job of sort of uh, using their old school mentality to their advantage by, um, you know, sort of grasping onto that. I mean, we saw them at, you know, they get to play the football game, halftime shows, they get to do this, they get to do that. I mean, some might argue that Nickelback is one of the biggest bands in the country. Um, but any true metal fan is going to say, well, they're not even really a hard rock band. Once again, sort of a pop band that's, that's masked with a little bit of heavy guitar here and there. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? I do. I mean, thank God we don't have Creed anymore. <laughs> You're speaking my language right now, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've played shows all over the place, including Ozfest and many other big shows. What's your favorite city to play live in? You know, it changes every year. This I just did my first headlining tour with a full band in February, and um, my favorite show, uh, besides Los Angeles, was probably Denver, um, but. I mean, it changes all the time. I mean, there's so many, you know, there was a, a show we played in um, Huntington, West Virginia, and the uh, there was like a confusion with the promoter, and the show was going to get canceled, and then it wasn't going to get canceled, and then it was, and then it wasn't. So uh, literally, like five people showed up, 
because the word yeah. had gotten out that it was canceled. But those five people, man, like one of them was like a lifelong Godhead fan and had every Godhead album and had all my solo albums. And I played the full show for for those five people because, you know, they're there for the show and they deserve the full show. So I did the full show and that was that was one of my favorite shows on the tour also because of how appreciative those people were that we still did the entire show that we were going to do anyway. And, um, actually I ended up, I ended up doing one of my best, uh, merch nights that night as far as like the amount of stuff that we sold because he just like bought one of everything. Awesome. <laughs> well, if you're going to have uh, only a few people show up better, good yeah. to have it be the merch buying people. Exactly. Well, yeah. Speaking of playing in, lots of different places. I'm rather curious about how you seem to end up on roofs playing covers all the time. Uh, well, that was, I did that. That was my choice. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I did, what, what I wanted to do was, you know, with Godhead, my voice was always heavily affected. Um, and by the way, I just finished um, the final touches on the Godhead remix album. I'm about to say I, I mean, I I didn't really do that much to it because we got 13 different people to remix the album, but I still had to assemble it. Um, and that's going to come out this year on Warrior Records, so you're still going to get some Godhead uh, from me this Very year. Nice. But, but the reason I decided to do the Covers on the Roof series was, um, God in Godhead, my voice is always really heavily affected. And I realized that unless maybe you saw us live, you... Um, didn't really know if I could sing or not. Once again, we're in the auto-tune generation. And so I decided to um, start playing my favorite covers on YouTube with one mic, no editing, you know, just start the song, here it is, and here's the end of the song. But, and, and, but then I thought, well, you know what? A lot of people do that, and what could I do to kind of stand out? You know, uh, half the time when you're on YouTube and you're trying to find your favorite song, what you find is some dude in his dorm room has <laughs> a horrible acoustic version of it, right? Yes. yes. Or you find the real one. So I thought I'd give people some scenery and and make it a little bit a little bit interesting. So I uh, every single one I'm on a different roof, and a lot of friends sort of got got involved and said, "Oh, you can play on my roof, or you can play on my roof," and. And, uh, and that's what I did. I think we've done like 18 of them, and, and I've had some different duets with friends. I brought them along, and, you know, it's been super fun. Oh, cool. Sorry. I have mail. <laughs> Anything good or no? Let's see. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> good. Okay. Personal email. Aw. Um, hey. Oh, sorry. No, I'm good. Go for it. All right. Well, I noticed you also uh, mentioned going to Denver, and uh, it looked like you had the opportunity to visit a place called Casa Bonita, a favorite restaurant of one Eric Cartman from South Park. And uh, you took a video to prove that it was indeed real and not just made up for uh, the show. Was it everything you thought it would be? Except for the food. Aww. Um, Everything was great, but... Uh, the food definitely um i mean i don't want to like i don't want to bust on their food but um it definitely uh the 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 uh, first of all, all right, let me back up for a second cuz first of all i had no idea it actually existed until our bass player zach was like dude we got to go to casa bonita i'm like what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> really exists. i'm like are you kidding me so yeah, there were there were cliff divers. There was a guy in a gorilla suit. There was a gun battle, <laughs> but um, the food is all you can eat, and you just keep eating. And the next thing you know, you're more stuffed than you've ever been in your entire life, and you definitely feel it the next day, if you know what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Oh but no, totally recommend going there. Like I'm going, you, you gotta go just to check it out because uh, I know I, I posted that little video of me walking around, but there's a lot. Yeah. More to it than just that a lot more oh just there's a pirate cave there's like a yeah there's 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 like blackbeard's cave and you walk in the cave and like these monsters jump out at you it's a killer i'm but going 
That's got to keep everyone's appetite up, you know, just scaring them half to death every five seconds. Right, exactly. Um, now, before we delve into your successful and wide-ranging acting career, I have a very important question for you that I uh, decided to ask after I saw a comment you made on Facebook. Okay. Looks like you, you two are eagerly awaiting the second season of HBO's series Game of Thrones. I am. <laughs> um, have you read the book series? I am almost through the first book. Okay, so no spoilers or anything, but uh, if for the second season of this, you know, there's there's a couple main factions. Who are you rooting for in this? I'm always rooting for the Starks, man. Go direwolves. Definitely. Um, but I re- I'm you know what? But I'm kind of rooting for the Starks and for Daenerys Targaryen because I want her to kind of you know. I want her to to succeed in some way. What I don't I don't want to see her sort of take over everyone else, but I do want her to be happy and at least get to go home. Ah, you know, but uh, you know now she's got three dragons, so we'll see what happens. I guess they got to yeah. get up first, though. You guys just spoiled the whole thing for me because I didn't even get that far in the series yet. So thanks oh, a lot. Oops. Oh. <laughs> Um, you guys, you can take that up with him. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know yeah, he was doing it to pull that out, so. <laughs> what the? I, 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 don't, I don't blame you at all, sir, don't worry. Okay. Hey, I write the questions in advance, man. All right, just keep going here. All right, before I ruin anything else for anyone, um, so, how did you, how exactly did you get started in voice acting? Like, was it always a goal of yours to do acting? I mean, live action and voice, along with being a musician? To a certain extent, I mean, if, if you really think back to ye olden times, um, you know, the traveling minstrels kind of had to do it all. They had to put up the stage, they had to sing, they had to dance, they had to act. Um, so I, I think music and acting kind of go hand in hand, or, or they have, you know, throughout the centuries. But um, what kind of sparked it, I, like I said, I grew up a huge geek. And I was a huge anime fan my yes. whole life, starting with Star Blazers from when I was in elementary school into wow. Robotech in, in middle school, you know, on up. So, um, and it's funny because like some anime fans don't even know what Robotech is. I'm like, are you serious? Like, oh. anime fans know what it is, but just like your average kid on the street may not know what it is now. Dragon Ball Z. I agree. There you go. And actually, I just did some episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh, so that was kind oh, of... Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, man. I, a couple of my friends would kill for that. <laughs> they love that show. The way, the way I kind of... The way it happened was I uh, started... When we had some downtime in between tours and whatnot, I started singing on commercials, which qualified me to be in the Screen Actors Guild. And... Um, so then that sparked me into taking some voice acting classes because I acted as a kid. I did community theater as a kid, so it wasn't a um, total uh, alien to me. And I, I took some classes and learned the terminology. And I approached a director at the uh, Anime Expo in L.A. like nine years ago. And... Turns out he was a Godhead fan, and that <laughs> nice. gave me my first my first voiceover job, and then it just sort of went from there. And so now I've been doing voiceover for about nine years, and um, it's really great. I actually worked on Guild Wars two earlier this week. Oh, nice! Um, and I've been working on Guild Wars two for like two years, and it's actually going to come out this year. So everyone's really excited about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something I take really seriously, and um, I really I do enjoy it a lot. And on camera stuff, I don't pursue as vigorously uh, because I am a musician first and foremost, and mm-hmm. songwriter and a performer, and that really takes up. If I if I decided to do on camera acting full time, that would that's definitely a full time commitment. Yeah. Uh, and and so, but occasionally, but I have agents for that, and occasionally I do get the call to do the occasional stuff like Battle Planet on the Sci Fi Channel, and uh, you know you know things like that. So, I I 
totally enjoy doing that too. Um, but voice acting is really my primary focus in the acting world. Well, stepping back a second, if you grew up with Robotech, doing Code Geass must have been a dream come true. If you like robots at all, that is. Well, yeah, absolutely. But more importantly, uh, working with Tony Oliver has been a dream come true because Tony Oliver was the voice of Rick Hunter in Robotech, and now he's a director. And so I've worked with him on several projects, and that's just been a trip because anytime I get a direction, it's Rick Hunter telling me what to do. Now, how bad <laughs> is that? Right on. Dang. Well, speaking of um, your vocal talents for doing voice acting, on your website, jasoncharlesmiller.com, you have a couple of demo reels from voices you've done in the past. Um, you, pr you really show your wide range of vocal capabilities. Your roles have, well, just from that demo alone, your roles seem to have ranged from the serious to the hilariously comical. And <laughs> hearing them in quick succession was, I must admit, I kind of laughed out loud a few times because got, you've got this really serious voice and then it sounds like you're a mad scientist for a second. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, you want to show yeah. your diversity on your reel, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I I've heard that people often struggle to find their voice well, you seem to have gone above and beyond the Call of Duty in this regard. From where do you get all these different voices and characters and intonations and stuff for your voice acting work? Well, you know, one thing I really don't do is impressions. Like, I don't, I, I'm not a very good impressionist of imitating other people. And so what I try to do is create, I, I see a description of, of the character and then I try to create that guy within me. And I think that's what helps. And also the fact that because I've been a singer my whole life and I know how to control my voice, I can, I can put characters in different, in, in different areas and use my singing knowledge to help with that. I guess that's huh. the, best, the best answer. Huh, so... Creating all these characters for yourself, like, you know, out of thin air, have you ever listened to your work and kind of been surprised and gone back going, that, that was me? Yeah, absolutely. Like, sometimes I don't recognize myself. Most of the times I do um, because I'll remember a certain thing. But speaking of Code of code Geass, this was really cool. One night on Cartoon Network, um, there's another show that I did called Morabito, Guardian of the Spirit. Yeah. And um, I played a character named Gene. And so I'm watching more beat. I'm like, cool. And actually, I really enjoyed the show. So uh, I, I watched it. And, uh, and so Morabito ends. And I've got the last line as Gene <sighs> is the last line of the episode, right? Then there's a commercial for ESP guitars that I happen to do the voice. <laughs> Metallica fans, you could win four tickets to Metallica, sponsored by ESP Guitars. And then, literally right after that commercial, Code Gia started, and I had the first line, <laughs> and I and I and I, and I TiVo'd it, and I'm like, and I called my girlfriend, and I'm like, listen to this, like this will never happen again wow. ever, history of the world. And that was like the coolest moment for me as a voice as a voice actor. It's better than that. Oh man! So like, I must admit, I, I also I listened down below to your commercial demo reel too. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to buy a Suzuki and then and a BMW, then eat a Baby Ruth while driving in both of them because I don't know. It's very persuasive. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm compelling you to do that for sure. <laughs> well, you've done a few other promos. For example, now this one was actually live action. You did some promos for Louis Black's Root of All Evil. And you did it as Nosferatu. Now, in, in, in that promo, um, in character, you said that it was unfair that vampires do not get social security benefits. Now, does that, does, does that reflect your own views on the issue? <laughs> well, <laughs> on, on vampires? They don't get social security benefits according to what you said. I mean, do, is, that, is that how you feel? I think it's a tragedy, you know? Although I think it would be a real drain on our economy because <laughs> however many vampires we have, they're never, you know, unless you slay them, 
they're not going to die. So their right, social right. security benefits just going to go on forever and ever. They're going to be a drain on society. <laughs> Nobody wants that. You know? And, and I guess, yeah, I guess that you don't really get much interest at the blood bank. But... You know, um, I can't. Did you find that online because it was online for a certain amount of time and then I couldn't find it again? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, if you want, I can, I can hunt that URL down for you. Yeah, that'd be and great. I'll give it to you a bit later, yeah. but yeah, I'll that, find it again for you. No worries. That was so much fun to do that. Well, I wanted to ask because it looks like, I mean, you, you got completely done over with white makeup. Your eyes were darkened. You had two giant ears like sticking yeah. out. How long did that take? I mean, did you just have to sit there for 45 minutes while people painted your face? Yeah. Uh, and, and when I got an opportunity to be a zombie in Day of the Dead, that was four hours. As I often say, four hours of makeup for four seconds on screen. Really? Oh, my that, gosh. That was, uh, that was quite, quite elaborate. <laughs> Um, the last project was nothing. I'm like, yeah, I've been this, done this before, no problem. I mean, how does that compare to any of the so to any of the makeup you had to put on for some of your metal videos? Um, um, much more intense. That was much. More, <laughs> the Godhead stuff. I can do that in like three minutes. You know, just because I've done it so many times. Um, so jumping around a bit. You said that you mentioned that you were a nerd, or were a nerd, or have some nerdy interests. Are you call him a nerd? S- You're just calling him a nerd. I'm a nerd. It's kind of insulting. Hey, hey. Yeah, hey. I'm, I'm still a nerd. I'm still a nerd. You can call me a nerd. It's okay to call you a nerd, all right. <laughs> okay, so you've done a lot of games, um, ranging from World of Warcraft, Guild Wars 2, to Street Fighter, Super Street Fighter 4. Have, of the games you've done, are there any in which you've played quite a bit? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had a really unhealthy World of Warcraft addition, uh, addiction. And it's funny because when I was on tour, when we were on tour opening for Jonathan Davis of Korn, um, we would, he also loves World of Warcraft, and we would exchange just like sort of World of Warcraft addict stories. <laughs> oh, no. But, uh, but I had to... I had to you know, it, it, I love MMOs, but they just take up so much time. And I had this epiphany the other day. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that any of us really outgrow things from our teenage years. It's just that you end up running out of time for them. Huh. You know, yeah. it, because it, if I, if I, if I could, and you know, it's funny. I, 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 I was. I was thinking, I don't know why, but I was thinking about Mitt Romney the other day, and I was like, <laughs> if I was as rich as Mitt Romney, why would I be running for president? I would just buy an island, fly a bunch of my friends out there, and play Dungeons and Dragons for the rest of my life. Yes. That's what I would do. <laughs> you are now that's, even more my hero. That, that, you know, that's kind of my, my goal. But, you know, being a being a... Uh, a nerd in the entertainment business is, is is fun when you can sort of experience those things. Like I have killed myself in World of Warcraft many times, you know, uh, which is really fun to go to try to find yourself in the game and then go kill you, kill yourself. But then also, um, I was a huge fan of the show, The Guild. The web series. Are you guys familiar with that show? Yeah, yeah. With um, oh gosh, why can't I remember Felicia Day? Felicia Day, and um, through uh, just through the production designer that happened to be the director of Battle Planet, but also knew uh, of my music side, he recommended me uh, to work with them when they were uh, writing their second music video song and. So I met the whole gang that way, and that was to premiere season four. And then in season five, I actually got to play myself in the show. That's all. Oh, um, that, that's always fun. So, instead of, so how, was it weird playing a character who wasn't a character but was you? Yeah, it was. I was a lot angrier. Yeah, <laughs> angry version of you. <laughs> oh man. So speaking of anger. 
Um, did you ever did you ever get around to playing Super Street Fighter Four much? Because if so, did you ever beat yourself up? You yeah, played, somewhat. Uh, guy. You know, yeah. Uh, profound sadness. People, people, you know, people ask me to. It's, it's funny. You just, you know, uh, pe- people ask me to say that all the time. It can be, uh, so morbid. Thanks, guys. Like yeah. you think they want you to say something a little more uplifting. Right. No, but they want to hear what I say when I die, so or when I when I get beat up. Ah, um. So, you've done a lot of different things. You have played Urabe and Code Geass, a bunch of characters in World of Warcraft, Guild Wars Two, and you've done some live action roles as well. Looking back, which what which one or two parts really stand as be, stand out as being particularly fun or just unusual? Probably unusual was. Um, and this is on this is on the voiceover side. Um, was being the voice of Casadora's tequila for a oh. <laughs> wow. Year, especially since I don't drink alcohol, you know. So it's like one hundred percent blue agave from the highlands of Mexico. Casadora's the one with the deer on the bottle, and uh, you know. To get that job was really funny because uh, that was just that was one of the more unusual ones for me. And then, um, really, probably the most fun was in live action was doing Battle Planet because not only do I get to command a bunch of troops in a laser battle, I get <laughs> captured by aliens and get disemboweled and eaten by the aliens. So I think that's a goal of, of any nerd would just love for that to happen in a movie. You mentioned that uh, you don't drink. I actually don't drink either. Has that been a difficult thing in uh, your line of work and you know, the rock star thing? Not really. People are pretty cool about it. You know, they're, uh, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty easy going about it. I don't, I don't preach to them to not to drink. So, you know, it's their choice and they respect mine. Right on. Uh, so we here at the show, we encourage our viewers to stay ballsy is our catchphrase. And it means that uh, you have the confidence in yourself to work hard and accomplish your goals. So where are some of the obstacles that you had to overcome in order to find success and get where you want it to be? Um, I mean, there, it's... A constant struggle, you know. I think what what I what I would recommend to people is just you've got to be tenacious about not giving up, and and you and you've got to have confidence in your abilities, and you've got to practice. I mean, it, uh, applying it to music and applying it to acting is like you've got to make sure that your worst performance is still 10 times better than anyone else's best performance. Because if you do that, that's the way you're going to succeed to where if you're having a bad day or if you're having an off day, it doesn't matter because you've still worked that so much that you know um, and you've got the confidence that it's still going to be, be, be better. I mean, that's so as far as like specific um, things, I mean, you know, I've had the whole, you know, beaten up by bully, had my head slammed in a locker, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, none of that really matters once you're kind of out there in the world trying to make it happen. So that would really be my, my recommendation is I can never stress enough the, the, uh, the importance of, uh, of practice. Well said. What future projects do you have coming out soon? Where can we find you and see you soon? Um, well, obviously, Guild Wars 2. Um, uh, so, there's so many titles I'm not allowed to talk about yet. That's what's really annoying. <laughs> that you've got the non-disclosure agreement on so much stuff. But I will say this. Um, my first official single uh, is being re- – my first official country single – as a as a solo artist is being released to country radio on April 23rd 
And um, the official ad date is May 28th, but I've already shot a video for it. So I actually have a seven song EP coming out this summer. Um, so look for that, you know, check my website and, and definitely a lot of music this year is coming out. We've got the Godhead remix album coming out later this year. So a lot of music for me and, and a lot of various games and, and shows that you'll, you'll find me in this year. So your, your website is jasoncharlesmiller.com. Yep. And, uh, you, do you have on Twitter and all that stuff too, Facebook and all that? Yeah, Facebook is Jason Charles Mitter. Uh, J- uh, the Mitter. Jason Charles <laughs> Miller is you know Facebook dot com slash Jason Charles Miller. All, all the links are actually at my website, so you can just it's real easy to find. And I'm on Twitter too. Okay, I'll have to say hi. Yeah, please do. I, I will. Cool. So I think I'll do it, man. That was really a lot of fun. Really appreciate you coming on. It's a great honor to have you on here. Oh, uh, thanks for having me. Where do you guys live? We are in the uh, New York area. So. Okay. Well, I might see you later this summer because I'm going to be on tour um, in July and August. So you'll have right, to right on. a show. Do you have any final words for our lovely audience? Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, w- I always clam up when people say any final words. You know, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of like, I'm kind of putting you on the spot there, so I yeah. apologize. But. I should, you know, I should have that planned out better. I really should. People just recite, usually recite some sort of uh, catchphrase or something. It's odd. All right, are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Winter is coming. All right. <laughs> that'll, do, that'll do it. So that's it for the show this week. We return next week at our usual time on Friday mornings. Thank you everyone for checking it out. For OJ, for Jason, this is John signing off. Thank you for being a part of John Rainbow Presents, the best and free and optional entertainment. Good night, everybody.